that repeat that. Yeah, Matthew, Matthew in chapter number 24, and then uh, we will also be over in 1 Thessalonians at some point here. We'll be going back and forth a couple of times because the two passages uh, walk hand in hand. So um, if you want to mark your place over in 1 Thessalonians, it might be quicker to find it here in just a little bit. Okay. And again, just more of a topical uh, message today as Brother Mark is, is, is traveling. And uh, he would be the one normally bringing the Sunday school lesson here. But um, The title of the message this morning here Matt found in Matthew chapter 24 is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching, I'm teaching this morning more on... on what I believe is happening, okay? Uh, the fact that I believe certain verses are coming into play, like right now, like there, it's going on. I think we're in the midst of it. Um, now that's my conviction. People can disagree with me on that, and that's fine. I'm not, you know, uh, you can, really, if you disagree with, with with me on that these things are going to occur, I mean, then we then we have a problem. You, you have a problem with the Word of God, but. If you disagree with me on when these things have started, or the, or if we're in it yet, uh, yeah, I can. I'm fine with you disagreeing with me on that. I mean, that's, I'm not gonna lose sleep. It's just this is something that I, I believe we're seeing, and I, I believe it can help us understand the world that we're living in and what we're seeing in people's minds, what we're seeing uh, in the movements of our world. But uh, Matthew chapter 24, and I, let's just. Uh, Let's read verses 6 through 12. Verses 6 through 12. Um, Jesus is talking to his disciples here and he says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences. Note that word pestilences. I'm going, to, I'm going to kind of focus in on that this morning. And earthquakes and in, in diverse places. In diverse places. We're in Matthew chapter 24 if you're just joining us. But notice verse number 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They're just the beginning. That's just the introduction to the book. <laughs> That's just the intro. <laughs> You haven't even got past the first chapter yet of the book, you know, and you're already going, whoa, I don't know if I want to read any further. Because <laughs> there's a lot contained in verse number 7 when you say, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. That's, that's a lot to take in in one verse. And Jesus is saying, oh, that's just the beginning. <laughs> if you think that's something, you ought to read the rest of the book, he says. <laughs> you ought to read the book of Revelation. But uh, verse number 9 then shall they deliver you. Then, after that, you know, either during that or after that, probably, probably both. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And tells you, he tells you why uh, we will be hated. Because we're Christian. His name's sake, Christ. Verse number 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, that, that's the reason, because of that, the love of many shall wax cold. Because iniquity will abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Wax means change over time. When you're not paying attention, it will turn cold. Okay, those are that's the, the text I wanted to look at there. Let's let's hold our place in Matthew 24 because we're going to be coming back and look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter number 5. We're just going to read the first three verses here. Uh, later on, we're going to read some more of it, but uh, look at verse number one. Paul says, 
to the church at Thessalonica, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. So he's talking about the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. He compares it to the travail of a woman with child. He, com he compares it to that. He, he, he says in that day that we'll be saying peace and safety, but sudden destruction is going to come upon them. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, something right here, just kind of <clears throat> to explain why I'm thinking the way I'm thinking. Uh, uh, but we, I believe we are in the beginning of sorrows. I believe we're in the, I believe we're in it. And I don't know how long that time period lasts. That, 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 that uh, verse 8 in chapter 24 says all these are the beginning of sorrows. I think, I think we're there. I think we're definitely there. I think we've passed some serious lines on God's timetable. I think we're, uh, we're in it. That beginning of sorrows you, you might think of as kind of the, the early contractions. He compared it to a woman in travail with child. The early contractions of birth. Uh, it'd be the very early ones. You know, the ones that uh, you ladies have experienced birth, okay? Uh, if you, I haven't experienced it. I've just watched Johnny, you know, and, and uh, I can tell when it's getting real. I can tell when the contractions are getting real. As far as from watching her reaction to the contractions. <laughs> Say that ten times fast. The reaction to the contractions. When I was watching, when I watch her, uh, and, and she's going, oh, Joe, I think that was a real one. It wasn't real. That wasn't the real one. If she is able to articulate it like that and say it calmly, no. When she's having the really bad contractions, she does not speak. I just watch her and she She grabs a hold of something. I'm like, oh, it's getting real. The baby's close. I didn't know that the first couple of kids we had, about Kaylee, about the third one, fourth one on, it's been that way ever since. I've noticed that, that when it's getting real, there's no talking about it. There's no healthy communication about where we're at. <laughs> it's just, you're in it. <laughs> it's coming. Baby's coming, fast. And, and, and here, we, we hear about nation rising against nation. We hear about kingdom against kingdom. Uh, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, diverse places, all over the world. We think, man, this might be the real thing. And we might really be in it. This might be the tribulation. No, 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 no. No, we're still talking about it. We're still communicating. When we're in it, when, when people are in it, it says they're going to deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. There's not going to be any open talking about it. There's going to be, you're going to be hiding and, and, and trying to protect your family. And, and there's no, no, no more time for talk. There's going to be no more of that. It's going to be the real contractions. See what I'm saying? See the difference? And today, we're still talking about it. You're still open to talk about it. It's still, uh, you know, there's still freedom to talk about it. But it's beginning to get militant. When you talk about things of the gospel, when you talk about things of the Bible... When you talk about these things, eh, it's kind of distasteful in society to bring up Jesus. It's kind of distasteful to quote anybody in the Bible. That's their view. Not mine. I don't share that view. But uh, it's not, they're, they're going to punch your lights out for it. Yet. It's not, they're going to kill you for it. Yet. You understand? You see why I believe we're in the beginning of the sorrows? Just in the beginning. And I don't know about God's timetable. I don't know how long that period of the beginning of sorrows lasts. I don't know if it's several generations. I don't know if it's just a couple of generations. I tell you right now, things are changing so fast and rapidly. The snowball effect, they call that, when a snowball starts rolling down the hill and it picks up speed. Um, it's, it's, it's moving faster and faster and faster all the time. This change in the world and this change in America and this change all over is getting faster and faster. So I, again, I can't keep up with the timetable. I have, I'm not one of those I'm going to predict in 2032 it'll be, no, I have no idea of knowing that. 
uh, it, we may be in the year 2100 before things get really violent, or the year 2200 where things start getting really violent to a Christian. I really, my gut instinct tells me it won't take that long, but we're going to get there. All these are the beginning of sorrows. I stumbled upon this. Okay, I stumbled upon this. this I, I, I was thinking about this word pestilences. Pestilences basically means diseases. Okay, diseases. There's going to be a... a uh, apparently, diseases are going to define this time of beginning of sorrows. Diseases is going to be one of the def defining things about it. Uh, earthquakes and natural disasters all over the world. It's going to be another thing that, that defines this time. And famines. Uh, I, I think we're seeing some. I think we're seeing a, a, a drought this year. We're seeing some some dangerous drought conditions. I, I saw uh, they were uh, reporting in the southwestern United States. Um, very dangerous drought conditions in many places. Uh, they were talking about some of these places uh, just southwest of here in Texas are going to have long term effects from the drought they're experiencing right now. Long term effects. I don't think this is the uh, worst we've ever seen. I don't think it's. You know, I just think. Things are beginning. You know, I think some things are starting. Whenever it talks about famines and pestilences and earthquakes and natural disasters, diverse places. I was looking up monkeypox. I had heard about monkeypox. I just heard about it. I heard a rumor. I haven't seen anybody with it. Heard there was like eight cases in Arkansas or something like that. And I was like, okay, I just want to know what it is. We just, I mean, we've been dealing with COVID for two or three years. I'm trying to learn everything I can about that. Let me see what I can learn about monkeypox. So, first thing I stumbled upon, and I'm, I just try to be careful who I listen to on the internet. That's another sign of the times. You have to be very careful who you're listening to. You're all kinds of misinformation. I was blown away that this was the first time I'd heard this. Blown away. I, was, I, listened, I, I looked up a guy that I listened to on, on, from time to time. He was the first suggestion that popped up. Uh, conservative uh, commentator. Kind of has a Christian worldview of things. And uh, he was talking about how monkeypox, let me quote it. What did he say? NBC News, whom I don't trust, yeah. reported on Friday, I cannot believe NBC News reported this, from the New England Journal, that of the 528 cases that they had reviewed of monkeypox, 95% happened, and again, I apologize for the vulgarity of this, happened uh, from sex between men. 95%. The guy who, uh, uh, the guy who said this, as soon as he said it, and he said it on Fox Business, Fox News, as soon as he said it, the other three panelists on the panel with him began to just absolutely interrupt him, be rude to him, called him a bigot, said we're not going to use that kind of bigoted language on here, just went on and on and on. And I went, hold on, he just stated a fact that he quoted from NBC News of all places. He just quoted, that, that's all he did, he quoted someone else. A fact that they know. He did not say. Here's some things he did not say. I want you to ponder this for a second. He did not say, all gay people are of the devil. He didn't say that. He didn't say, all gay people are going to burn in hell one day. Yay! He didn't say that. He didn't say anything like mean toward them. He didn't say anything rude. He just said, 95% of the cases that they studied, of the 528 people, he specified that. Of the 528 people that they studied, 95% contracted it from gay sex. That's what he said. Can't say that. Can't say that. I mean, they went off on him. Let me read you this article that Rogue Review has of this show, of this particular area. It says, during the Fox Business panel discussion about the rise of U.S. monkeypox cases, host Kennedy Montgomery used uh, the left-wing tactic of addressing facts and statistics with the loaded word bigoted. 
American Majority CEO Ned Ryan laid out a clear suggestion for avoiding, avoiding monkeypox. He said, and I quote, As for monkeypox, I think there's a pretty good rule in life, don't attend gay orgies. The panel, consisting of Kennedy and two others, erupted after Ned mentioned gay orgies. I don't want to read this whole thing. Listen to this uh, comment to a person who comments on this article. This guy's by the cynical stoic on Twitter. He said, The real irony is that Ned is the only one saying anything that could actually help gay men in this matter. Isn't that ironic? He's the only one that's actually saying anything that could help them. He said, Avoid gay orgies. No one on the panel stopped and asked the question. That No one stayed rational and calm-minded. None of them. They all immediately got angry. None of them went, well, I think his name was Ned, right? Ned, how do you feel about uh, gay sex in general? Do you feel like people shouldn't be gay? Because he didn't say that. He said avoid gay origins. And then he said 95% of the cases were between male and male. That's what he said. He just said a couple of really hard facts that hurt some people. It hurts. The truth hurts a lot of times. It hurts. That's all he said. He didn't say people shouldn't be gay. He didn't say that. So they could have asked the question, uh, Ned, uh, do, you, are you, uh, do you not believe people should be homosexual? They didn't ask that. They didn't say, Ned, do you feel like people uh, in, in, who are heterosexual, that's people who, you know, man and woman, Ned, do you feel like they shouldn't go to orgies? They didn't ask that question. They didn't say, Ned, do you feel like heterosexual people shouldn't be practicing sexual stuff with multiple partners? They didn't ask that. They just immediately went into, you're a bigot, you're done commenting on this So I really, because I watched the clip, I have no idea what Ned's views of other things are. I have no idea, because they didn't ask. They didn't bother to ask, they didn't care. They had their agenda. Why am I saying this? Because I, let me give you what God's Word says. God's Word, if we're not clear, let's, let me just be clear, and if you want the scriptures on this, there's so many it can't even begin. Uh, God is against gay orgies. Uh, he's against heterosexual orgies too. Uh, God is against uh, gay sex with multiple partners. He just happens to be against that. He happens to be against heterosexual sex with multiple partners. God happens to be against gay sex with one partner outside of marriage. Just clarifying. He's also against heterosexual sex with one partner outside of marriage. Now here's where the, this will probably be the real rub. God is also against gay sex with a spouse. Because he's against gay marriage. Because the definition of marriage, you will find in the Garden of Eden, is Adam and Eve. It's, it's between a man and a woman. That's it. And, and the reason I know that God isn't, isn't for men having multiple partners or women having multiple partners, I, the reason I know He's not for that is because He didn't make ten women for Adam. He made one. He didn't make ten men for her. He made one. And He gives us in the very beginning what he views as the perfect picture of it. Now, have we all messed up his perfect picture in some way, form, or fashion, whether it's in our thought life, in our intentions, how we felt sometimes? Sure. I'm not pointing the finger at anybody. I'm just telling you what God's view of it is. That's it. I, I'm, not say, I, I'm not saying anything to be hurtful. I don't try to hurt people's feelings to just hurt them, okay? But he's against all these things. You say, why, Brother Joe? Because it's what he calls sin. 
It's sin. That's what it is. I'm just clarifying God's position on it. Because before I had even watched this clip, before I had even read this article, my wife was asked, before I even knew that 95% of the people that were involved happened to be homosexual. Before I even knew that, Johnny was asking me, she said, what do you think about this monkey pox? What do you think it is? I said, the judgment of God. I really do. Even before I knew all the other details, I was just guessing. I was just kind of shooting from the hip. I said, I bet you it's a judgment of God on our sinful nation and on our sinful world. I really think so. I think COVID's the same thing. And I, th I think they're just the beginning. I really do. And I don't think it's begun with them. I think it began with AIDS. I think it's been going on a long time. I really do. I think it's been going on a long time. I think there's judgments built into this stuff. And if people don't want to heed God's word, I, I, can't, I can't make them do that. All I can do is try to warn them. We're in the beginning of sorrows. We're in it. <laughs> The judgment of God is beginning. It's here. I, you say, uh, when do you believe the judgment of God began, Brother Joe? I don't, believe, I don't believe it began this year. I don't think it began in the 1970s, 1960s. I don't think it began. I, I believe it's kind of been starting for a while. I tell you, I was shocked to learn of a, a flu epidemic. I, I watched a video uh, on this. Uh, the details of the flu epidemic that hit, I believe in 1914, would startle you. It's shocking. What was going on back then? World War I. World War I was going on back then, 1914 to 1918. They said uh, people started basically drowning to death. Like, from the flu. I can't remember what else. They, they, they had other names for it, but they, they basically label it, the, the basic name I found for it was the flu pandemic of, the, of 1916, something. People would turn blue, literally turn blue, and drown to death. It was alarming everyone worldwide. The first cases they found were of some Chinese workers traveling in Canada. Those were the first cases they, they found. And they were traveling on a train. They were all bunched together in a, in a basically in a boxcar. I think they were being smuggled into Canada, if I remember correctly. Right. But all of them got it. A lot of them died. It quickly spread through Canada. It quickly spread through the U.S., a bunch of our soldiers got it in training camps in like Kansas, where they were training to go over and fight World War I. A bunch of our soldiers got it, traveled to Europe. It became worldwide. Uh, one commentator was saying World War I really kind of ended because everybody was sick. If you want to, like, in the trench warfare that was over in, in Europe at that time, it just spread like, like mad. And they really didn't know what it was. To this day, they still don't know what it was. It went away when the war ended. Nobody knows what it was. We just kind of call it loosely the flu. We, that's alarming to me. You mean there's a disease out there that we caught 100 years ago? And we still don't know, even know what it is? And they're just waiting for it to pop back up. They really believe it will. The Surgeon General of the United States caught it at that time. It, it was like everybody was catching, and it had a pretty high death rate. I was shocked. I was, you mean that's been going on? Hey, I believe America has been turning away from God for a long time. I believe the world has been turning its back on God for a long time. I believe the judgment of God be, has begun for quite a while. I believe it's been going on. I just believe it's getting ramped up. That snowball effect. I believe it's going to happen faster and faster and faster. I believe the decadence of our world is bringing it on. Now, simultaneously, folks, let me also clarify something. Uh, while God's Word does condemn uh, sexual sin, 
Uh, God's Word condemns any kind of sin. You can also be proud of how non-sexual you've been. And that's sin. <laughs> Being proud of how good you've been. Uh, God condemns all sin. Here's something He also does, though. God loves sinners. God loves sinners. While hating sin. And He is yearning for them to come to Him in repentance and faith and be, and be forgiven of their sin debt. That's what God is yearning for. He's wanting people to come to Him. Um, let me also specify this, because when we start talking about homosexuality, there are people who take extreme positions on this stuff. There's some people who, who believe it's an un, that it's unforgivable. And then there's some people at the other end of the spectrum who don't even believe it's a sin. They believe a, a, a pastor can be gay. There, there are ordained pastors in our land that are practicing homosexuals. Let me clarify. Uh, there's only one unpardonable sin found in the Bible. There's only one. Only one. And it's not homosexuality. It's not. You may, you, that, that sin may uh, gross you out, you may not like it. I, I get it. But that's not an unpardonable sin. I've known, I've met Christians who used to be in that lifestyle, who used to practice that, and have repented and turned to the Lord, and they are, I'm, I'm telling you, they're some of the best Christians you can meet today. They really are. Uh, they're careful who they tell that to because they don't want to be judged. They don't want to be, people to be mean to them about their past. Who doesn't? Who wants people to be mean to them about their past? But I'm telling you, some of, the, some of the best Christians I've met, there, there's, there's two or three that I have in mind. Some, some, and they're some of the best Christians I've ever met. You say, why do you think that it... I think, they know what, I, I think they know what they've been forgiven of. I really do. And I think they're thankful to be forgiven. Uh, Another uh, argument that I would make that homosexuality is a forgivable sin, uh, the church at Corinth. The Corinthian church, 1st and 2nd Corinthians is written to the Corinthian church. Those people were, you know, a lot of them were practicing homosexual. Uh, homosexual. A lot of them you'd call bisexual today. They were into both. The Greeks, it is well known, believed it was higher education. For young boys to practice sexual acts with their male teachers. Alexander the Great, he really did. I mean, the, the, there's so many cases of it, I, I can't even, it, 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 it's hard to even talk about. That was in their culture. And they were forgiven of it. Okay, A person who comes to Christ can be forgiven of their sin. I don't care which sin you're talking about, except for there's one, the Bible talks about an unpardonable sin, and it's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. People are going to differ on what they believe that is. All kinds of Christians, you know, there's going to be plenty of Christians who go, Amen, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and then you're going to have tons of different views of what that actually is. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I've been convinced, because I've studied that, because it's a very important chapter. I believe it's found in Matthew also. But Jesus is warning the Pharisees about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And here's what the Pharisees are doing in that chapter. He is healing someone, and they basically say, you're of the devil, Jesus. They said that to him. And uh, he said, blasphemy of, of uh, the Son, and, you know, blasphemy of the Father, those will be forgiven, but blasphemy of the Holy Spirit will not be. Now, again, you could make a case, uh, maybe it was some, some people believe it was just particular words, you know, basically uh, saying anything that, that Christ does is of the devil. I don't, I don't believe that. I see why they believe that. And I believe the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, is when a person rejects the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible teach about that? Okay, the Holy Spirit of God is convicting people of sin. He's convicting them to come to Christ. The ultimate rejection of that is the only thing that's going to send a person to hell. A person rejecting Jesus' forgiveness. That's it. That's what's going to send them to hell. The Holy Spirit of God is wooing them. He's convicting them. He's dealing with them. He's trying to get them to come to Christ. And, and they say for the final time, no. You say, Brother Joe, when is that final time? I have no idea. I think it's absolutely different for every person. I think some people get one chance to be saved. 
And after that, and let me say this, I think when a person commits blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, they won't want to be saved after that. That's another telling thing that you have not committed it. People will get it in their head. The devil will use this, and he'll try to convince you, oh, you've committed the unpardonable sin. If you had, you would have no want to be saved. You'd have no care. You study the Pharisees after that, that conversation, they are cold-blooded killers. And they don't care who they're killing. They don't care he's the son of God. They don't care he's the Messiah. They say Caiaphas, the high priest, at that time, they say he was buried with Jesus' nails in his hand, thankful he had gotten. That's Jewish tradition. It says that. That's how, that's how crazed that man had become. Say, so how did that happen? The rejection of the Holy Spirit of God. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I believe that's what it was. Uh, I think my dad was telling me about a girl one time uh, in, their, in, in the church we, that I grew up in. Um, and this girl, you know, correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but this girl uh, basically was under conviction and, and, and basically told the Holy Spirit, uh, leave me alone. I don't want anything to do with you. Just, you know, all that. And uh, she, she attested at church. She said, and, uh, you know, I've never felt conviction since. I haven't wanted to be saved since. Very possible that girl had committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I hope not, for her sake. I hope the Holy Spirit came back and dealt with her later on in life. But she was bragging about it. Had no want to be saved. Had no concern for her soul. It's the Holy Spirit that brings concern for your soul. It's the Holy Spirit that brings that to you. It's the Holy Spirit of God that, that is warning you. It's the Holy Spirit of God that brings conviction and brings the concern. So when a person says, like, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin, I can pretty much tell them, no, you haven't. <laughs> if you had, we wouldn't be having this conversation. You wouldn't care. Does that make sense? Homosexuality is not an unpardonable sin. It's just not. It's forgivable. Okay? Just like heterosexual sin is forgivable. It is. While it may leave scars, while any sin will leave scars, any sin is going to leave bad memories, any sin is going to have its repercussions, it's still forgivable. You see what I'm saying? It's still forgivable. But when we look at these pestilences that are going on in our world today, I really believe uh, we're looking at the beginning of sorrows. I believe we're looking at the beginning, just the, the early contractions of a mother, is about is getting ready to get give birth. Uh, so many of us preachers, you know, we're, we're like, I think we're right in it. You know, we're, it's coming. You know, and, and Christians who stay there, we're, we must be in it. There, there are good, well-meaning Christians all over who believe we're in the tribulation right now. And I've got news for them: No, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. This is nothing like what the tribulation is going to be. It's just the beginning of sorrows. You know, it's, it's like that mom who's like, I, I think that was a real contraction. I think we're really there. <coughs> no, you're not. There have been times that Johnny's panicking. She's like, I think we need to go to the hospital. I think, I think we're almost there. No, you're not, honey. Not yet. When I get serious about getting her there is when she's no longer talking. <laughs> when she's just grimacing and getting serious. Um... Look back at Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 12 really quick, and, and we're going to uh, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 uh, very quickly. I'm going to try to move quickly here as we close this up. But Matthew chapter 24, look at verse number 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I've got to warn you, uh, this is, I believe this is mainly written to Christians. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Uh, I believe this also applies to lost people. Uh, the more and more that the lost world is caught up in selfish sin, the less and less love you're going to see worldwide. I'm talking about genuine love. I'm talking about people caring for one another. I'm talking about, and we were just talking about that, was it Wednesday night, uh, where I was talking about how people used to wave to everybody? They don't do that anymore. You're going to see that start to go away. Why? Because the love of many is waxing cold. It's going away. Especially, in, I mean, lost people, what, what people don't realize in America, especially in America, uh, it's been a Christian environment for the most part. Uh, not a perfect environment, not, not, not saying that. It's just, it's had Christian laws governing it. It's had a Christian worldview. Uh, you go anywhere else worldwide a hundred years ago and ask them about America, well, that's a Christian nation. 
That's what they'd call them. Why? Because they had that kind of worldview, just in general, just kind of generalized. So people were pleasant with each other. They're polite to each other, even if they don't like each other. <laughs> They're still polite. They're still friendly. Okay? That's a byproduct of being around the Christian environment. It's kind of spilling over even onto the lost people who don't even believe in Christ. They're still polite. They're still going to be friendly. All that's going to go away. When you start getting uh, further, uh, closer and closer to the tribulation, you're going to see uh, lost people being a lot more rude, a lot more abrupt, a lot more violent. That's why it becomes, then shall they deliver you to be afflicted and, and shall kill you. It gets to that point. It, it changes over time. The love of many shall wax cold. But let me also say this, though. This applies to Christians. We as Christians have got to be careful because the more and more we see iniquity abounding, that's what it says, because iniquity shall abound. Iniquity is sin. The more and more we see sin abounding and people getting away with it, and it's just everywhere. It's in our face. Uh, it, it's, it's just, our culture is just saturated in sin. Because of that, if we're not careful, the love of uh, our love can wax cold. And it's it's love. Of, okay, how did Jesus summarize the law for you know for us Christians who want to serve Him, who want to be pleasing to Him? How does He summarize the law? Oh, love God and love your neighbor. And the more and more sin abounds, the harder and harder it gets for us to do that because we're. We're finite too. You know, we have, we struggle with our flesh. We get mad at people. We get we get if we're not careful, we can get mad at God. Um, we we get mad at circumstances that happen to us. We get mad at getting sick, or we get mad at uh, you know gas prices. We get mad at the economy. We get mad at all kinds of things that are going wrong. And if we're not careful, our love waxes cold, and we become cold toward God, and we can become cold toward everyone around us. You see what I'm saying? And that's the warning that Jesus was giving to Christians. Don't, you know, when you're seeing all this junk happening in our world, and it's, it's despicable, it's terrible, don't stop loving. Don't stop loving God. And don't stop loving people. Amen? That's when it's really difficult to love them. And that's when we really need to. Let's uh, close with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. See, I told y'all to mark your place. I didn't even mark my place. But uh, I want you to see if Paul isn't saying the, pretty much the exact same thing here about loving people, about doing right, serving the Lord. Uh, verse, uh, chapter number 5, verse number 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren, that's you Christians, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others. That means grow cold in your love toward God, toward people, as do others. But let us watch and be sober. Being sober there has the idea that that word uh, means being focused, uh, being paying attention uh, in the world that you live in as a Christian. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love, there's that word love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. I'm so glad he hadn't appointed us unto wrath. And when it says that, when it's talking about that word wrath, it's talking about the tribulation. Okay, we haven't been appointed to that. But to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Uh, <clears throat> I'm aware the world's changing. I'm aware that it's getting darker and darker. And I'm aware we're the light. So if I could encourage you, Christians, let your light shine. Keep loving God. Keep loving your neighbor.
And again, Jesus described, uh, defined who your neighbor was. It's everybody. It's the Samaritan. Okay, it's everybody. So if I could encourage you, keep the faith. Stay faithful to the Lord. Keep loving God. Keep loving people. Heavenly Father, as we close this uh, Sunday school hour, Lord, I, again, I, I hope no one listening uh, gets the idea that I'm trying to be cruel or or harsh. I'm not. I, I'm not. I don't want to condemn anybody. Uh, but Lord, I, help, help them to realize that you mean business. This is serious, and you're not you're not playing around. Uh, Lord, uh, whatever sin someone is struggling with, they need to turn. They need to turn to you. They need to come to you uh, in repentance and faith. And Lord, they need to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, help them to quit playing games with you. Uh, we are in the beginning of sorrows. Lord, uh, this is not a time to be fidgety and, and playing around. Lord, we we need to get serious about these birth pains uh, that we're seeing happen. Lord, if there's someone listening that isn't saved, I pray they'd get saved. And for those of us who are, I pray that you'd help our love not to wax cold. Help us to stay faithful. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.